artists filled with the Spirit begin to make all the articles of the tabernacle, all pointing to Christ. And Jesus calls Matthew the tax collector in the midst of controversy into the ministry. Today on 3 in 1, as we consider Exodus chapters 37 and 38 and Mark chapter 2. Well, believe it or not, we are nearing the end of another Old Testament book in the Bible, the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus is coming to a close, and as we are nearing the end, in order for us to end clean, we are going to look at two and one, this episode and the next. So today, the two chapters that we're going to look at are Exodus chapters 37 and 38, where gifted artisans filled with the Holy Spirit begin to work on crafting each of the articles of the tabernacle according to God's very specific plan. For each of these articles have a very specific purpose and a very specific prophetic meaning. Remember, the tabernacle was supposed to be a shadow of the reality of the throne room of God in heaven. And beyond that, each article is prophetic in that it speaks of the fulfillment of Old Testament worship found only in the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. Every article shouts his name. The tabernacle itself shouts his name. The very courtyard of the tabernacle shouts his name. So today, let's take a journey from the outside in as we together approach the tabernacle to worship. What do we see first? Well, we would see a rectangular wall of white with only one door, with only one way in. This would be the white linen wall, 75 feet by 150 feet surrounding the outer courtyard. Even the color and construction of this wall speaks of Jesus Christ and his righteousness. As one would approach this white wall, one would notice that his garments would be like filthy rags in comparison to the purity of this white linen wall. And then you'd see that there's only one way in, one way in to worship, one way in to see the things of God. There would be a gate, a door. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. Jesus is the door. He's the gate for the sheep. He's the only way in. The only way in to worship is through him. Now, the gate itself was supported by four pillars, possibly speaking to the four gospels, possibly speaking to the four living creatures. Now, once inside the courtyard, you would be immediately confronted with the altar, the altar of burnt offering, where the sacrifices were completely consumed by fire as they were given to God, speaking of the sacrifice of Christ, the Lamb of God, who was completely consumed by the fiery wrath of an almighty God, pouring out the full penalty for the sin of all mankind, past, present, and future. Ephesians 5, 2 says, Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Then after the altar was the bronze laver, where the priests would wash their hands and their feet before serving in the tabernacle, speaking of the cleansing that comes with the confession of sin and the receiving of Christ's righteousness by faith. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 13 and 14 says, The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are, who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? The blood of Jesus is able to cleanse our consciences so that we can serve the living God. Nothing but the blood of Jesus can do that. But the blood of Jesus can do that. If a guilty conscience has been keeping you back from serving God, Go to the Lord and settle this issue. Confess your sin. He will forgive you and he will cleanse you of all unrighteousness so that you too can serve the living God. Then as we're moving forward, we approach the tent, the tabernacle within the courtyard. Two rooms and again, only one way in. The first room was called the holy place and it contained the altar of incense, the gold lampstand and the table of showbread. And the second room was called the holiest place or the holy of holies. And inside was only the Ark of the Covenant, also called the Ark of the Testimony. Now, the tabernacle was rectangular in shape as well, a temporary structure, but more than a tent, intricately constructed with boards and sockets and coverings, four different types of coverings that speak of four different aspects of Christ. The outer covering that took the beating was made of badger skins. 
dull and drab on the outside, speaking of Jesus, who had no beauty or majesty on the outside to draw us to himself. Then there was the next covering underneath, ram skins dyed blood red, speaking of Christ's sacrifice. Then there was goat skins, speaking of Christ as the sin bearer. Then there was the innermost layer that was visible inside the tabernacle that was fine linen, blue and purple and scarlet with cherubim embroidered all over, speaking of heaven, royalty and redemption, all pointing to Christ. Well, once inside, you would see the altar of incense, speaking of Christ's intercession for the saints. And then the gold lampstand, speaking of Christ as the light of the world, and the table of showbread, speaking of Christ as the bread of life, the only way to have fellowship with the Father. Then there was the veil, the veil separating the holy place from the most holy place, speaking of the separation caused by sin. And the day that Christ died, God ripped the veil in two in the temple from the top down, symbolizing the removing of the separation caused by sin because Christ paid the penalty for sin in full. Well, until the day that Christ paid the penalty, there was still separation and only one man once a year could enter in, only on the day of atonement and only with blood. Once inside, he would see the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Testimony. Wait, how could he see that? Only if the glory of God was present. Otherwise, it would just be a pitch black room. Otherwise, it would just be darkness. And the same can be said for the human heart. See, in the new covenant, our hearts are his home. Our hearts are now the holy of holies. And apart from the indwelling of his Holy Spirit inside our hearts, there is only darkness. But if the glory of God is there, there is light and life. Well, inside the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant, made with wood, speaking of Christ's humanity, covered with gold, speaking of Christ's divinity, containing the tablets of stone, containing the law, the evidence of our rebellion, which Christ pulled into himself on the cross of Calvary, sealed by the mercy seat, where blood was poured out, where God would sit, Effectively saying, if you want to move mercy aside to look at the law, you have to get by me. The law provides no clearing, no cleansing, only condemnation. And apart from the shedding of blood, there is no mercy. There's no remission of sins. So there is a mercy seat sealing in the law, the testimony, the evidence of our rebellion. Speaking of Jesus, taking all of that into himself and pouring out his blood for us. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the very righteousness of God. Every article, every aspect, every page cries out the name of Christ, anticipating the day when Christ would be the fulfillment of all these endless sacrifices that could only cover sin. See, Christ was the only sufficient sacrifice that could cleanse sin. So he was offered once for all. Listen to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26. Otherwise, Christ would have to suffer many times since the creation of the world, but he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Sent to save sinners by the sacrifice of himself. Sinners like Matthew the tax collector, the one that we read about today in our New Testament reading in Mark chapter 2. Matthew the tax collector more of a mobster rather than an accountant, hated more than the Romans because he had become a traitor to his own people. See, tax collectors would bid how much money they could bleed from the people, and the highest bidder would be hired by the Roman government. What made it worse was that the only way that the tax collectors would make a living was if they bled even more money from the people than what was bid to the Romans, and the tax collectors were often very, very wealthy. And yet in the midst of controversy, constantly being confronted and questioned by the religious rulers, a time where most men would be conservative and play it safe, Jesus decides to walk right up to Matthew in his tax collector booth and call him into the ministry, to call him into his ministry in the same community. I mean, talk about taking a chance on someone. Then there's you. <laughs> 
Who do you identify with in this chapter? Is it the man on the mat, unable to get to God, unable to get to God on your own, invited, brought by a friend? Maybe your friend was hoping that you would be healed, but all you wanted was to be forgiven. And Jesus knew that. And knowing that, he says to your soul, because of blood, you are clean. Because of blood, you are forgiven. Or maybe you are Matthew, beyond even being the black sheep of the community. They would have to create a whole new category for you. And yet Jesus doesn't care about any of that. He only cares about you. He came to save sinners. He came to save you. And the only qualification that you need is to admit that you are a sinner. Does that describe you? Whether you have been a traitor to your own people or to your own God, either way, wickedness, selfishness, rebellion, are any of these in your past, your present, feeling helplessly pulled towards them even in your future? There is hope. There is Jesus. He can walk right up into your mess with authority and rescue you, release you, rip you up out of the pit and place your feet upon a solid rock. Listen, I can just hear Matthew singing this psalm from Psalm 40. I waited patiently for God to help me. Then he listened to me and he heard my cry. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out from the mud and the mire, and set my feet upon a rock, a firm path, and steadied me as I walked along. He has given me a new song to sing, a song of praises to our God. Now many will hear of the glorious things that he did for me and stand in awe before the Lord and put their trust in him as well. See, you can sing that song. You can sing that song too if you will only surrender your sin, surrender your soul to him. He will save you. He will set you free. He will even call you into the never-ending ministry of loving and serving him. So like Matthew, answer his call and follow him today.